So this week we're working on the second part of this portrait. Within this video, I'm going to be talking about all the techniques I use to paint portraits, and we're also going to be discussing the most common mistakes that new painters make. There's going to be a lot of information in this video, and I talk pretty quickly. So sit down, relax, maybe grab yourself a cup of coffee, and let's get started. So the first area we're starting with is the forehead, and we're going to begin by adding in some of these creases and wrinkles. Now I'm going to zoom in on the video and show you this in real time, just to show you a few of the techniques I'm using here. For these wrinkles, I want a sharp and well-defined line, so I'm using a tool to help me out, which is an airbrush shield. As you can see, when I'm spraying with the paint here, I'm not spraying over the whole shield. I'm choosing individual places on it and adding more paint in these areas. If I sprayed the paint evenly across the whole curve, the line is going to look way too sharp. It's going to look like a cartoon. It's not going to look natural. And the reason I know that there's a variation in this line is because I'm looking at my reference. So this gets us into the first mistake that new painters make, and that's not studying your reference photo or your subject. It doesn't matter if you're painting from life one-on-one -on -one with a model or you're painting from a photograph. The subject that you're observing is going to tell you all the information you need to paint the portrait. The more people you paint, the more you're going to learn about shadows and highlights and varying textures. And you're going to learn pretty quickly that it doesn't matter what the age, the gender, or the ethnicity is of the subject, there's a lot more in common with people than there is different. But then learning how to spot these small differences and being able to translate them onto your canvas is going to make a huge difference in your ability to paint different people. But of course there's all different ways to paint and many genres in art, but in this painting lesson we're talking about mimesis in art, meaning that we're observing a subject and doing the best we can to translate that onto a canvas using paint. So in my opinion, there's no better way to learn painting portraits than by studying your subjects. So now that we have some paint down on the canvas on the forehead here, I'm switching over to an eraser and a razor blade to pull out some of these highlights. While painting the forehead, some of that overspray from the airbrush got onto this eyebrow, so I'm going to have to switch back to my X-Acto blade and basically just start cleaning it up. So unlike painting with traditional oils and a paintbrush, when we're painting with an airbrush, we're always going to get a soft line, and what that means is we're also going to get overspray. This spray pattern is one of the great benefits of using an airbrush because it naturally is going to give you soft lines and it's going to give you a nice transition from dark values to light values without having to use any extra tools. But the downside of that spray pattern is that it's very difficult to get sharp clean lines that you can get with a paintbrush. So that gets us into mistake number two, which is not using any sort of shields or masking tools to help you out. Now of course you're always going to have some airbrush purists who tell you that you should only be painting with the airbrush and not using any sort of erasers or shields, but in my opinion airbrush shields are absolutely necessary to make the whole process so much easier on yourself. So just like in oil painting where I use large soft brushes to blend the paint and give me a soft line. In airbrushing, I use shields and masks to give me sharp lines. So in the last few minutes of working on this forehead, you can see that I'm working on one small section at a time. This is very important. I work on the bottom part of the forehead and then just slowly work my way up. Each area I paint is going to help guide the next section I paint. So now that I have a few parts of the forehead in, I'm switching over to my texture template and then lightly spraying this over the area I painted and then just above it in this blank section, trying to break up that smooth white surface of the canvas. Eventually when I add some paint on top of this, most of that texture that I added is going to be pushed away to the background, but it's still good to add a little bit in before you go into the actual painting. So as I continue painting this, I want to keep switching between different tools to add a variety of textures in. So you can see here I'm using a ripped piece of paper to add in some of these subtle textures, kind of give me some organic edges to some of these creases, and then always switch back to my eraser to pull out some highlights and add some different texture than what we'd get from that texture template. So when I'm airbrushing, I'm basically always thinking that once I put paint down, I'm going to go over to my eraser, pull it out, and then I know when I'm done with that, I'm going to go back to my airbrush. So it's kind of like a, a cycle, just repeating the, the three steps over and over until I get a texture that I'm basically comfortable and happy with. Of course, I'm always looking back at my reference and deciding what tools are going to help me achieve what I want to paint. So I can see here that there's some organic edges, and then I notice up here that this wrinkle has a sharper edge to it, so I'm using my airbrush shield. But of course, when I'm spraying with this, I'm trying to spray in random areas to get a variety of, of different thicknesses in that line and also making a real conscious effort to not worry about making mistakes when I'm doing this because if I sprayed that line in the wrong area it's no big deal I could erase it out and I could just start over and this is gonna lead us into mistake number three where thinking that making mistakes is the end of the world and I know that I rant about this in all my videos but mistakes are a good thing on every single painting I work on I make hundreds of mistakes I could even see them right now in this video you may not notice them because you know you weren't the one who painted this but when you paint your own you're going to notice your own mistakes and it's a good thing because they're going to teach you when you notice you made a mistake 
mistake, you're practicing your skills in observation because you're seeing the difference between your painting and the subject that you're working from. Honing in on your observation skills is going to make you a way better painter and eventually a better artist because you're going to see things in your subject in your own painting that you're going to want to change and also maybe things in life, things that you want to talk about that you want to portray in your art. And the best way to convey these concepts is to have a strong technical foundation. So accepting fear and failure is actually a good thing in art and it's also going to help you improve. I promise you that. In the first part of this video, I talked about the importance of starting with light values and then working your way up to darker values. So now that I have these lighter lines in, I feel pretty confident with them so I could start defining them more with different tools. So here I'm using a colored pencil just to add in some darker shadows into these lines and then coming back with my airbrush and darkening up just by spraying more paint. Since I have this transparent flesh tone in my airbrush already, I'm going to lightly spray it over the right side of this forehead just to put some value down in there that I could erase into. I don't always have to start with the skin texture template to add skin textures in. I could start with some paint and an eraser and then use that texture template later as long as I start with light values which is going to bring us to our next common mistake which is spraying too much paint the reason that it's important to start with light values and slowly build up to dark values because it gives you some room for error as we just talked about making mistakes is certainty in every painting so what's nice about starting with lighter values is if we make a serious mistake we could basically just erase it out either using an eraser or sometimes you could even use some cleaner some um, 4012 reducer and just light clean up an area you know on a tissue or a cotton swab and basically just take the paint right off the blank canvas and since we're using transparent colors in this painting it's really important to exercise some restraint because if you apply too much that color is going to get dark very very quickly it's always easier to remove a small amount of paint than a lot as I'm working on this forehead I'm only using one color which is the flesh tone that we made in last week's video which is hundred percent transparent now when I say transparent I mean that I didn't add any white to it when you're using white paint you have a pigment inside called titanium dioxide which is very opaque and it also has some strange properties Properties, which I'll eventually talk about in a future video. But when you add white or titanium dioxide to any other pigments in a mixture, not only do you lighten the value, but you also add a layer of opacity to it. So when you spray over other colors, it's basically going to cover them up. When you spray with the transparent color, you're just darkening the value with whatever hue you're spraying. Although I love painting with transparent colors, they're definitely less forgiving than opaque colors. When painting with opaque colors, the value is going to stop at a certain value because of that white in the mixture. But when you're spraying with transparents, you're controlling that value by how much you lay on. So I want to make sure that I'm pulling back on the trigger very, very slightly, just enough so that I see paint coming out of the airbrush. While I'm adding these wrinkles in, I'm not only spraying a small amount of paint, but I'm also trying to bounce that paint off the edge of the shield. If you can see on the shield here, you'll see that most of the paint is actually hitting the shield and the overspray from the airbrush is laying onto the canvas getting pushed onto the canvas from the shield that way I'm controlling the amount of paint by not only how far I pull back on the trigger but also where I spray it so this is a technique of basically using that overspray to our advantage we could spray on another section and let that overspray fall onto the area where we want the paint using that shield to kind of make the the painting process a little bit more controlled for ourselves so now i'm going to add some more texture to this using that skin texture template and here we're going to move the texture template around back and forth left and right and spray in sync with it here what i'm doing is moving the two together left and right left and right and what you're going to see is we're going to get these very thin lines almost looking like very subtle wrinkles in the skin not like pores or anything like that, but small imperfections and textures that are, are different than those circular dot textures that we get if we just spray directly over the shield. And this is going to bring me to my next mistake, which I think is very common among new painters, and that's trying to get every single detail from your photograph into your painting. Although we're practicing here and we're using this portrait as an attempt to try to learn more about the subject we're painting, we don't want to try to copy every single thing and add them to our canvas. First of all, it's impossible. And and secondly, if you're able to get it as close as you can to a photograph, why not just use the photograph, right? There were art movements in the past, especially starting in the 1960s with photorealism, where artists would basically try to copy a photograph one-to-one. -one. Um, these were called the photorealists, artists like Richard Estes, um, Chuck Close. And if you want to try to emulate that style in your own painting, that's a great thing. Go for it. But I think that when we're trying to make our own art, we're trying to express certain things about the subject we're painting, so exaggerating some 
different areas is a good thing and I think it, it changes it it makes it different than the photograph and it makes it a painting and at the end of the day that's what we're trying to do we're trying to create paintings we're not being human copy machines and for the last hundred years there's been an ongoing debate among artists art collectors and um, critics basically saying that if a photograph can do such a great job what's the purpose of a painting now I'm not going to get into the argument or try to debate either side so to stop myself here we're just going to continue on with the lesson maybe we'll get into this in the future where we talk about concept rather than technique so to start painting in the hair I'm going to add in some shadows using some sepia in my airbrush now this is just sepia by Createx illustration colors thin down with a few drops of distilled water and what I'm doing is I'm lightly spraying it just above the forehead where the hair is going to be now it's important to know that I'm not actually painting in the hair right now what I'm doing is I'm placing in shadows and these are going to be blocked in so that I could eventually add highlights with an erasing tool next to them and when painting hair this is really the most important thing it's best to try to paint lots of hair so large clumps of hair together rather than individual strands of course when you are painting there are going to be small hairs which are called flyaway hairs um, that come up and you're going to see we're going to be doing that quite a bit on this portrait but it's it's way more important to focus on those macro details where you see large highlights and where you see large shadows in the hair now let's slow this video down to real time so I could show you how I pull out some of these highlights using the exacto blade I'm starting at the top of the forehead and flicking out lines as I do this the razor blade is going to grab some of that paint and it's going to pull it right off right down to the blank canvas when we do this the hairs come out pure white because we're just seeing gessoed canvas but that's not a big deal because we can glaze a color over it later to darken those values back down while I'm working on this you'll see that I'm constantly switching direction because the burr at the end of the blade is switching from one side to the other so you'll notice that paint pulls out better in one direction than it does in the other direction so if you notice yourself having difficulties with this try using the blade in different directions if you're really having trouble removing the paint using an exacto blade or an eraser it may be that your canvas is too rough or your surface is not smooth enough if there's a lot of texture in the canvas that paint is going to seep down into the crevices or the weave in the canvas and when you erase you're just going to be pulling out the paint on the top sections basically on the bumps of the canvas so from my experience I know this is a very common mistake with new airbrush artists trying to paint portraits now of course there's nothing wrong with painting on a textured surface it's a great thing you get some really cool effects but if you're trying to use erasing techniques on that it's gonna hurt you so I recommend setting up a very smooth canvas and down below in the video description I will have a link for a video I made a few months ago showing you how I set up all my canvases so since the video you're watching right now is in real time you can see how slow I actually paint with all these speed painting videos that I see online and all these social media accounts of people showing their amazing art it's easy to assume that these paintings were done quickly of course there's situations where artists paint quickly but I don't and I'm not one of them so I think not having patience and trying to paint too fast is a major mistake among new painters I know it's exciting when you're working on a painting and you feel like you're almost at the finish line and you want to start rushing but this is a big mistake because it's gonna hurt you painting is all about being alone and exercising some patience and working one-on-one -on -one with that painting it's not a race and there should never be a deadline for a painting this painting took me about 25 to 30 hours in the course of about a week and a half and this is not an extremely advanced or complicated painting it's definitely on the difficult side but it's not that hard I just noticed that I'm a slow painter I've always been a slow painter and it's it's kind of the way that I enjoy it I like to sit down for 20 minutes to a half hour and then take a break and then come back you know maybe an hour later and work for a few hours a day on it learning to paint slower and to take breaks and walk away from the painting really does wonders not only does it make the painting process more enjoyable for yourself but it also makes it less stressful as I'm working on the hair I'm removing the values adding in these highlights slowly layers at a time I'm basically just building these up one layer on another while you're working on hair make sure you're looking at your reference photo or your subject to see which way the hair is flowing because that's going to tell you where that hair is going to go and where you're going to need to pull out those highlights so I'm going to switch back to my airbrush with sepia and then just lightly spray this over the hair this is a glaze we're spraying a transparent layer of paint over this and basically knocking the value down and also shifting the hue from that white color more to a, a grayish color and after some of that value values in I just start pulling out more highlights and I'm just going through this process over and over while working on this painting you may have noticed that this portrait is larger than life size the actual size of this canvas is 24 inches in height and 18 inches in length the reason that I'm painting larger than life size is that I find this way easier than smaller paintings if you find yourself struggling with painting trying to add in detail and you're finding it difficult it may be that your painting is too small and this is definitely a common mistake with beginners 
Now, I personally love small paintings. I think they're really cool to look at in person, but there's no doubt in my mind that if you're painting a portrait that's life-size or slightly smaller, it's way more difficult than a larger painting. The main reason for this is that when you're trying to get in detail, if you have a larger canvas, you have more room to work, so you're not trying to squeeze in all these little tiny shadows and highlights. And if these small details are off, the smaller painting is gonna exaggerate them. If a highlight's wrong on a part of a cheek, it's gonna distort the whole face. Of course, this would happen in a larger painting too, but in a larger painting, you have more room to work on it, and you have more room to adjust it. So if you struggled with portraits in the past, try painting a little bit larger and see if that helps you out. Next week, we're gonna finish painting this portrait and we're gonna get into the details about some of the textures underneath this eye and the large macro areas of skin texture, mainly around the cheeks, the cheeks, and the nose. So as I'm winding down this video, I want to talk about the last two mistakes that I think are very common in new artists. Number nine on this list would be ignoring art history. If we look into the past, there's a lot we could learn from artists that came before us. The very concept of applying pigment to a substrate goes back thousands of years. And to use that pigment to render forms and shapes to represent a human being, which we now call portraiture, was a human invention. And this invention is always attributed to the Renaissance, which is where it was popularized, but it definitely dates back before that, around the 12th, 13th century during the medieval art period. Now, of course, I'm not implying that you need to go to art school or get a master's degree in art history, but gaining an understanding of where art comes from is a very humbling experience. And since one of the goals of art is to communicate with others in a more abstract form than language, Looking at art from those who came before gives us some insight into their life and to their experience. And yet, it may take some work to understand the art that you're looking at, but it's going to make you feel more connected and less alone. And finally, number 10, that there's no right way and there's no wrong way to paint. I've come across this so many times and I think it's an important thing to understand that you could paint any way you like. Rules can be great in the beginning to kind of steer you in the right direction, but if you let those rules become a cage, you're going to be trapped and you're going to have a difficult time expanding from it and trying to reach out to create your own artwork. So experiment and try different techniques and see what you like the most because that's going to make the whole painting process so much more enjoyable for yourself. And if you made it through this video, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate that. But just take everything I say as a suggestion. I'm in no way implying that my way of painting is the right way or the correct way. It's just the way that I found is most comfortable for me. And my hope is that some of the techniques I use may be helpful to some of you out there. So next week we'll finish up this portrait. And in that video, we're going to be talking only about technique. And again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.